it's authored or co-authored more than 125 articles and abstracts related to today's topic. He is considered one of the outstanding researchers in the area of magnetic resonance imaging, and we are pleased to have him at this conference. We are looking forward to hearing him speak on the topic, Behavioral Neurophysiology of the Motor Conte uh, Cortex. Dr. Georgopoulos. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the afternoon session. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the organizers of this conference for the invitation for me to participate in this neuroscience feast. It is a great honor and a privilege to be part of this occasion. Uh, second, I would like to acknowledge that the data or the results that I will present, uh, that they have been obtained over a period of uh, maybe 10, 15 years with uh, uh, closely working colleagues uh, whom I will not acknowledge by name because there are too many and too precious to be somewhat reduced to simply naming. Um, but uh, I'm a uh, team person, I haven't done much all by myself. You can't do anything by entirely yourself in this field. And I would like again to acknowledge, to acknowledge the unfailing uh, support and uh, help from all my collaborators. Uh, we might as well start then. Well, the, the conference, uh, the theme of the conference is unlocking the brain, so I thought might as well uh, show you a lock and a key. If there is something to unlock, uh, we probably need uh, a key to unlock it. And uh, what, uh, the point I want to make, though, is that uh, there are quite uh, a large number of, of issues and problems uh, in brain uh, uh, sciences that uh, we, we still don't understand, of course. Uh, but I, I don't think there is any uh, unique uh, question that will have a unique answer. Uh, more or less, we're dealing with a lot of different locks, uh, therefore a lot of different keys. And during the past uh, few lectures, you, you heard uh, some of these examples. Uh, Dr. Kandel had a beautiful molecular biological key to uh, learning and memory. And Dr. Huber had an, uh, a powerful microelectrode key that I'm using as well. And uh, uh, Dr. Damasio had a sort of unfortunate experiments of nature that is lesions of the brain is one of the ways to look into brain function. So there's still around uh, several uh, grand uh, theories of the brain. Uh, I don't feel qualified to develop one, so my talk will be rather uh, focused, if you want, on, on specific issues and how we get some idea about what is going on in the motor cortex, the structure that controls movement, uh, rather than propose a generalized uh, uh, theory uh, actually, a very nice summary of the different theories and problems in the issue, problems and issues in the field you heard yesterday from Dr. Churchland. Well, the first part, part of my talk will be uh, relating to some uh, recent experiments we have been doing with the human brain, looking at the human brain using uh, magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, the second part of my talk will be mostly of what, uh, dealing with what I'm doing for a day-to-day -day living, which is uh, looking at the brain of monkeys and trying to understand how a small brain circuit uh, works. Well, the human brain, uh, you see a photograph, a photograph of it uh, on the left, with all the peculiarities of the sulci and gyri and the difference, we appreciate the difference between the two hemispheres, and one you would say that, that what we call mind, as Dr. Hubel mentioned, is just the total sum of the immense combinatorial almost uh, interactions between the different elements, and uh, that uh, humbles us and makes us uh, rather modest in, in what we are trying to achieve and understand in the long run. Now, there are a few different ways you can look at the brain. Uh, a venerable one is just to open the skull and look at it. So you see here a photograph from the work of, uh, of, of Penfield, Wilder Penfield and Rasmussen. Uh, and, that, and that work is, uh, is actually, uh, was done and still being done 
uh, for the purpose of removing epileptic uh, foci uh, in the cortex. And for these operations, you need to know where the, the seizure uh, locus is. So uh, one would open the brain and uh, the, uh, open the skull, look at the brain, and try to localize the epileptic focus. Well, how do you do that? Again, by using a venerable technique of electrical stimulation and the simple way of putting a piece of paper with a number on the part of the cortex that gave you certain response. Uh, you see here again two examples from the work of uh, Penfield and Asmussen. And uh, what was discovered with these techniques uh, were uh, two, I think, you know, quite important things. One was we, we learned quite a bit about the somatotopic organization of the motor cortex. And one reason I'm showing you these slides is to take advantage of, the, of that work uh, and, and uh, take from there on the more detailed investigation of one uh, sub-area of the motor cortex. So if you stimulate electrically the surface of the cortex, you elicit movements of the contralateral, uh, uh, some contralateral part of the body, be it uh, fingers or, or hand or, uh, or face or uh, uh, leg. Uh, on the other hand, what was found by these uh, workers by stimulating other parts of the cortex, especially the temporal lobe, that uh, in some cases they could elicit very vivid memories from old uh, uh, childhood uh, memories. And uh, uh, not that that particular observation led to any major discovery, but it was, it was a very useful technique that had to be done anyway for, for uh, medical purposes, but provided a worth of information on uh, somehow the initial gross organization of some areas of the cerebral cortex. Now, you understand that this you cannot uh, really do on a routine basis, uh, even if you volunteer. I think the existing ethics committees will not allow you to be a, a paid volunteer for such an operation. Um, it is still being done uh, for epilepsy uh, in a much more sophisticated manner. You might have heard of the uh, so-called subdural grids. There are sheets uh, of plastic with uh, up to 30 or so electrodes that you can implant subdurally, that is underneath, on the cortex, underneath the dura, uh, in, in patients with epilepsy, and you can record the activity, the electrical activity that you can get from these electrodes and try to localize the focus of the, of the scissors. So when an operation time comes, one can get a good, uh, a good localization. Modern techniques looking at the brain, uh, uh, actually th this slide summarizes what I, I referred to a moment ago, and that is that by electrical stimulation of the, of the motor cortex, uh, the somatotopy, somatotopic organization was confirmed, that was previously inferred actually by observing how the seizures spread in grand mal uh, Jacksonian epilepsy. And it so happens that if you see here the central sulcus, there are, and you see words here, hand, uh, face, and so on and so forth. It means that electrical stimulation at these points will elicit movements of these body parts in the contralateral side. Uh, our work that I will describe you uh, in a moment and a little later deals with, uh, with movements of the forearm and an arm, this reaching movements in space, and uh, that is the function that I will be I will be concentrating on. I wanted to simply to mention that if, if we did know about the somatotopic organization, it would be very difficult to carry the work that I will describe you. Uh, another, another way that you can uh, look at that is, is shown here in the coronal section where you have the representation of different parts of the body. And uh, Dr. Kandel mentioned the fact that the representation is actually proportional to the use that one makes of the parts of the body. So you have a big hand representation, a big face, uh, but relatively small uh, sort of uh, leg and, and trunk. Well, modern, modern techniques uh, that, uh, by which one can look at the brain, first of all in a structural fashion, are, uh, are essentially based on, uh, on magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, you see on the left uh, the, an uh, image of the cortex in an oblique slice, single slice uh, of, the right, uh, of the right hemisphere. This is a 12... Uh, a uh, 12 millimeter slice, uh, uh, superficial oblique slice of the cortex. Uh, you can take uh, uh, horizontal sections. This is a horizontal uh, MRI with a pretty good uh, gray uh, white matter 
uh, differentiation and you see the different nuclei uh, in the thalamus and the putamen and so on. Both of these uh, uh, slices were taken using uh, a high field magnet that is in the University of Minnesota Center for Magnetic Resonance Research. Uh, and this work has been done in collaboration with our colleagues in that center. Uh, there are essentially uh, three magnets in that center. One is a high field four Tesla magnet. This is the, the highest field that the FDA will allow for use in humans. Uh, to give you an idea, four Tesla is about 80,000 the magnetic field of the Earth. And uh, it's more than three times uh, stronger than the 1.5 Tesla that is usually used for clinical work. In the center, there are also two uh, higher power, higher field magnets that are used for animal experiments and in vitro work. Well, the four Tesla magnet is one of, of four in the world and one of three in the United States, and as far as I know, the only one completely dedicated to brain research. And it's pretty comfortable. Uh, it's 125 centimeters bore, that is, you can, you can lie there comfortably without feeling too claustrophobic. And these are some other technical characteristics of it. Now, one can use the, the, the MRI for two main reasons. One is structural one, and you saw an example before. Uh, the other is, which is, which is uh, very exciting, is for functional imaging uh, of the human brain. And what we mean by functional imaging or uh, dynamic imaging, as Dr. Damasio mentioned, is uh, trying to get an idea of changes uh, in, the, in, in local metabolic and or, and or hemodynamic signals in areas of the brain that seem to uh, involve, to be involved in process specific tasks. The whole idea is the same that is used for uh, PET imaging. Uh, that is, the idea is that if you perform a task and you need a certain brain area to perform it, then uh, there is local use of, uh, of uh, the metabolism changes locally that, that uh, elicits local changes in blood flow, in, uh, in other hemodynamic changes. And that results in some change in the area that per participates in the task. And if you have the proper technique, like the PET or the MRI, you can, you can identify uh, which areas are responsible for which tasks. The advantage in general of the MRI is that you can do that in a single subject. You have very good uh, spatial resolution for brain imaging. Uh, you have to be very careful not to move at all. It's very sensitive to motion artifacts. So it has pros and cons, but it is, it is a technique that is evolving very fast and, and has a great promise. Now, the particular technique that we're using for brain for MRI imaging is based uh, on, the, on the fact, uh, on the uh, uh, somehow outlined here on the, on the slide, that is if you have a, a small voxel, a volume, and you have a small vessel, a vessel running through it, then the, uh, the hemoglobin can be in essentially two forms, oxygenated or deoxyoxygenated without oxygen. And this is a paramagnetic substance uh, in contrast to this, which is a, a diamagnetic one. And the relative ratio uh, of the two of them uh, will give you a signal that the, uh, the magnet uh, the, uh, can detect. And in fact, the higher the field of the magnet, uh, the better the identification of this, uh, of this signal. This is a rather recent observation. I think the whole field using hemoglobin as an endogenous contrast agent started in 1990 or so by the work of Sergio Gao at Bell Laboratories and has been uh, quite, uh, quite a useful tool for, uh, uh, for these studies. So essentially, what you do is uh, uh, the, the following. We, we ask the subjects to perform a task. And in this case, the task was to make uh, uh, alternating movements between the thumb and the fingers. So uh, before, during, and after the performance of the task, we take images. The images uh, used to be like 10 seconds would take for an image. Now uh, it's much faster with modern techniques. Uh, you can take images 100 milliseconds or lower, although the biological signal that gives you uh, the, the meaningful signal doesn't change until a second or two. So the, 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 the bottleneck, if you want, is in the, in the biological signal, not so much in the, in the magnet itself. But in any case, you end up with a time course so these are successive images. They were 10 seconds per image. They were uh, from our initial work. And you can see here that during the pre-task period, there is a baseline 
Uh, this is arbitrary intensity, signal intensity, essentially the ratio of the two forms of hemoglobin that I mentioned to you. Uh, and then when the task is on, when the movements are being done, in this case by both hands, uh, there is a abrupt increase in the signal that stays on, and then at the task off, uh, you get back to the baseline. Uh, this is a uh, trace from an old study. The, uh, some common reason I show it is that uh, two reasons. First of all, the change in intensity here is is, is wonderful, is almost more than 100%. And number two, uh, I am the subject here. I have been the subject. So it's been a motor physiologist. I'm proud of my performance in the motor task. And, having a, and I want to share that with you. Uh, usually, the, the, uh, the changes in intensity we get are about 10% uh, or so. We can detect down to 2 or 3%. But uh, uh, it's, it's usually of the order of magnitude of you know, 10 to 30 percent that we, that we see as changes. So what, what then we do is uh, uh, process the data, make a decision whether this is uh, significantly different from the background, the pre-task period. And we end up with maps of that sort that are uh, similar to those that Dr. Damasio showed you yesterday, only with, with uh, somehow better immediate uh, uh, image of the, of the structure of the brain. And, and here you see localized uh, activation of the motor cortex that is in front of the uh, central sulcus, the precentral gyrus, during movements of the contralateral fingers. Uh, here there are two actually composite uh, images, one superimposed on the other, one from an experiment in which the subject moved the hand, and, and you have the yellow activation here, and another in which moved the foot the toes actually, and you have the medial activation, and if you, if you move the uh, upper arm and so on, you have activation in between. So with this technique, uh, we're able somehow to, uh, it's not a matter of confirming, but you know, make sure that we can see similar somatotopic organization as one had seen, had, had shown before with the um, electrical stimulation technique. What we did then, uh, as my interest is more in sort of quantitative uh, work, uh, whatever that can be done, was to measure the area of activation uh, of, uh, uh, in, the, in the motor cortex, in the precentral gyrus, under a couple of different conditions, which are summarized here. What we wanted to know, there are two things. First of all, uh, whether the left and the right uh, motor cortices were symmetrically uh, involved in the performance of contralateral or ipsilateral movements, and number two, whether there were any differences between left-handed and right-handed people. Now, we all know the hemispheric asymmetries between the left and right hemisphere, uh, the, the predominance of the left hemisphere in, in speech function and of the right supposedly in visual spatial tasks. Uh, hardly much is known about any existing asymmetry uh, in, in an area as supposedly simple as the motor cortex, which is somehow the final pathway from the, from the cerebral cortex to the spinal cord and brainstem structures regarding motor function. Now, uh, let me explain to you first the, the, uh, the slide on the, on the left side here. Uh, let, let's start from the right hemisphere. So there are data we had about, if I remember correctly, uh, uh, um, the left-handed people, uh, I believe, were, uh, were nine and about the, the same number, or uh, actually there were, I think, six left-handed people and nine right-handed people. So we're looking here at the right hemisphere while movements were performed with a contralateral hand or the ipsilateral hand. Now, the right hemisphere behaves much like we would predict as a null hypothesis, if you want, and that is that is involved mostly, if not exclusively, uh, with performance of the contralateral of movements with the contralateral hand. There is a small uh, but significant activation with performance of ipsilateral movements, you see here with the eye, which was not exactly uh, well known, but, but was not surprising since anatomically, uh, the, the corticospinal tract, there is small percent that, uh, that is uncrossed, so you might expect to have this involvement. Uh, now, what was very surprising, though, is when we looked at the left hemisphere, and there the picture was quite different in two respects. Uh, one, one respect, the relative activation on the motor cortex uh, between contralateral and ipsilateral movements was quite different from the right hemisphere. That is, 
you had more involvement of the left hemisphere with ipsilateral movements relatively than, than the right hemisphere. So the ratio of the, of the long bar over the, the shorter bar is smaller here than it is here on the right. And second, even, even more uh, intriguingly somehow, this was even more pronounced uh, in right-handed people. This exactly was counterintuitive. We were expecting, uh, if anything, the, the representation of the right hand, the dominant hand, in right-handed people to be quite prominently represented in the, the, in the, in the uh, motor cortex, in the left motor cortex. Instead, we seem to have a, a, a reduction in this representation, if you want. And uh, one can hypothesize, uh, you know, it doesn't cost anything to put out hypotheses, but it's, uh, it seems uh, that maybe in, this, in the, in the, in the right-handed people, uh, it, the, the use of the hand is so well learned and, and so well practiced that almost as probably other motor skills, it is not the burden of the day-to-day -day cortical, motor cortical function, and it is probably being delegated to subcortical structures. This is something to be further determined. Now, uh, what was also interesting is that this, this relationship, that is the, the more predominant involvement of the left motor cortex in, this effect, uh, seemed to be, uh, m uh, or if you look on the slide on the right now, um, even quantitatively varying with the, with the laterality quotient. So it's, uh, uh, what, what it shows is this, uh, the activation on, in all the individual subjects here, uh, the, the longer bar, the contralateral activation of the motor cortex versus the laterality quotient, the Endeburg uh, inventory laterality quotient, in which 100 is complete right-handedness and minus 100 is complete left-handedness. You get this number by completing a questionnaire how you cut the bread and with which foot you kick a ball and so on and so forth. And what you see that there is a, a continuous, a continuous uh, reduction of the, of the activation here, of the involvement of the cortex with the, with the, with the contralateral, with, with the right hand function, that is the left cortex, as a function of handedness. And we had even an ambidextrous subject that, that also seemed to be along the band of this relationship. Uh, well, that was, that was exciting uh, somehow to us and uh, because we, it was unexpected. Actually, in, in retrospect, it might have been expected. There are results or observations in people with strokes and the capacities of use of their, right, of their uh, good hand uh, and there seem to be some uh, hemispheric asymmetries there, but these were usually attributed to, to damage in association cortex, parietal cortex, not really to the primary motor cortex. What we're currently doing is running a, a series of uh, in these tasks of homozygotic twins that uh, uh, were very privileged again to have one very large inventory in, the, in, the, in, in Minnesota, uh, trying to see whether, uh, I mean, twins that are left and right-handed in each pair and still have the same genetic makeup. So we're trying to see if some patterns of activation uh, could, could be related to genetic uh, uh, fac uh, factors or are completely dominated by handedness. Now, imaging is, is very good. It's the only way at the moment one can look at the human brain, but you cannot get any information about the mechanisms. That is, how is it that information is being processed in a given area? So, we are moving to another, to another key and another lock, perhaps. Uh, and uh, now this is more properly, if you want, how the cells interact in the motor cortex. And I think I'll, I'll, uh, I'll uh, hopefully persuade you that, that we have found a small key, that we can open a small lock, but uh, 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 still quite uh, interesting to us. Now, what we, uh, what we do and what we would like to know uh, is all of these activation patterns. Well, all of these are metabolic signals, essentially, or hemodynamic signals. What is generating those signals in the, in the vasculature somehow is how these cells work together and how intensely they interact. Uh, they're making metabolites, synthesize proteins, open channels, closing channels, and so on and so forth. And this is just a diagrammatic, uh, I wouldn't call it a cartoon exactly, but a, a diagrammatic uh, drawing 
of, uh, of, of the cortex with the different cells, pyramidal cells with the dendrites going up and extending and the basal dendrites, uh, uh, the afferent uh, pathways and so on and so forth. It's, it's this beautiful complexity of interaction between these cortical elements that we would like to know uh, what is going on. Now the technique we, 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 we use is, uh, is, ex is, is exactly what Dr. Hubel described to you yesterday. And actually, I uh, Dr. Huber that he allowed me to use his slide that he almost showed. He just passed by very fast, so my eye caught it, and I, I asked if I can borrow it. Um, so what you see here is the microelectrode near one of the cells, and it is the electrical activity in these cells that we pick up with these electrodes. We amplify, we look at an oscilloscope, and, and that is our, our database. Now, uh, Dr. Huppel showed you a great video. You heard the sound of these, of these neural impulses, so-called, and these are the, the, uh, the spikes, that's another word, neural spikes or, or, or impulse trains. And so what do we do in our case, uh, unlike what uh, Dr. Huppel described you, is that we have an awake behaving animal. Uh, of course, you can study the mechanisms of voluntary movement in an anesthetized preparation by definition. So we have to have a, a behaving animal that is, that is making movements and simultaneously we record the activity of cells in the motor cortex and other areas of the brain. And we are trying to see how can we predict the movement that the animal makes? How can we tell what the animal does or is planning to do or intends to do or remembers if you want based on the neural signals that we get from these recordings? Now, that means that you have to use an animal for that. We can do it in humans. And our animal is, has been exclusively the rhesus macaque. Uh, is a, is a, a, a very extremely intelligent, specially intelligent uh, animal. Uh, you see an outline of, of its brain. It's the central sulcus here. This yellow area is the motor cortex. And uh, the area that we're investigating is, is around here. You see it much better here in, this, in the photograph from the brain of one of our monkeys uh, in a small area of recording here in front of the, motor, in front of the central sulcus. And that is the area that controls uh, region movements, control movements, controls movements of the contralateral hand in space. So if you stimulate there, you elicit movements of the arm. If you record the activity of single cells during performance, the cells are not firing, are not active with movements of the fingers or the tongue or the leg, but they are quite active with movements of the contralateral arm. Now, one way we show this, and a standard way of, of displaying these data, and you'll see several of them, of those, you know, in the rest of my talk, I want to explain to you, uh, is the time that the spike takes to happen, it's about a millisecond. It's the time is small relative to the uh, hundreds of milliseconds that the task uh, is, is lasting. So we tend to present them as point processes. That is a single, single event. Uh, and, and, and what you see here are, are uh, six uh, trials or so that are associated that were recorded from one and the same motor cortical cell during performance of, of a movement in the same direction in the same amplitude in space. So every time you see a small bar, it means that this cell fired an action potential. Uh, in this longer bar, the, the target changed from an, a current position to a new position. On a plane, the monkey was required to make a movement to the target, a pointed movement. So this is the reaction time from, from this, from here to here. All the trials, as you said, aligned to M, to the uh, onset of the movement. And then the movement is done around this period here, and it ends, uh, I guess, around here. I don't have a, 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 a sign to, to indicate that. So what you see here is that this particular cell, uh, and by the way, this is a histogram of the, of the differences of the ongoing cell activity if you subtract this period where the animal holds without doing anything. So when, when, when you follow that, uh, in this particular case, shortly after the target shifted, which was in a way the command to, this, to, the, to the animal to move, uh, you have an, an, an increase, a dramatic increase in cell activity uh, within, this is 100 milliseconds, within about 100, 120 milliseconds in this case. So this happens during the reaction time, that is while the movement is being planned, there is no movement going out there yet, and when the movement begins, the activity of this cell actually subsides, it retains a higher ongoing activity at the end of the movement, 
But what, what I would like to point out is that about you know, 20, uh, 85 or 90 percent of cells in the motor cortex will change activity very dramatically during the reaction time, starting from as early as, uh, say, 80, 70 to 80 milliseconds after the onset of the stimulus, uh, and peaking at about 120 milliseconds after the onset of the stimulus. So it's a very, uh, it's a very intense activation of the whole structure just preceding and planning the movement. Now, the, uh, uh, the, task, the task that we used, and uh, let me... Well, it seems that one slide may not have gone in place. All right, so... Okay, fine. Uh, misplaced one slide, but that's fine. All right. Now, the, uh, as this is as this is a study of behavior, we have to to control the behavior of the animal. And as the study, our interest is for in zone movement, uh, and specifically on region movements in space. Uh, we used two essentially essentially two different ways to control the movement. One was training the animal to make movements on a plane from a central point to a, peri a peripheral point. Uh, so uh, these, these dots indicate uh, the lights, that the light will come on, the animal will move this handle uh, there, the animal will sit at A and then try to move. Now, uh, when I said before that the target shifted, I meant that the, 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 uh, center, the center light went, uh, went out and then one of the peripheral targets came on, so the animal had to move to make a directed movement from center to number two in this case. So if you do it in different directions, you have movements that are done in different directions, but different amplitudes. Excuse me, but the same amplitude. Uh, on the right, uh, there is a more generalized task in which the animal makes movements in three-dimensional space from a central point, pushing a button, and then another light will come on and the animal will move from one button to another, so will again make eight movements in different directions in space. Now, what we wanted to know is, is what would be the activity in the motor cortex under those conditions. Uh, you can see already similarity between this uh, movement orientations, if you want, uh, and the uh, orientation of the, of the luminous bars that Dr. Hubel uh, showed yesterday. And our hope was, back in the early 80s, that uh, what the case would be in the motor cortex is that we would find cells that would be sharply tuned to the direction of the movement so that uh, if you want to move in a given direction, you can then coherently and uniquely activate a subset of cells that would be very specific for that movement. That would be very close to what uh, we, we know uh, for the visual cortex. However, what we, what we found is, what we found instead is that uh, cells in the motor cortex are not specific for any given direction, but uh, are very uh, broadly tuned with respect to the direction of the movement. You see two examples here, one from the uh, two-dimensional task and one from the three-dimensional uh, performance. Now, these data on the left are all from one cell, and the different lines indicate repetitions of the same movement in the direction indicated in the center. So this cell increases activity very much with movements in these directions here. Then you have an orderly change uh, for different movements and it's actually uh, decreasing the activity quite a bit for movements in this direction. If you take the average intensity of activation and you plot it against the direction of the movement, you get a broad tuning curve uh, it is really broad. Uh, Dr. Huber mentioned in the visual cortex, you may have a plus or minus 20 degrees around the peak of tuning. Here is, it covers the whole continuum from uh, zero to 360 degrees. So it, it's very broad tuning. Uh, the same, uh, interestingly, the same general function uh, was observed in the, in the three-dimensional case, where here you have uh, movements made in different directions, and still you have a, a, a broad tuning and what seems to be the important, uh, the important aspect here is this angle between the movement direction and what we call the cell's preferred direction, C here, 
which is the peak actually of this curve. This is the direction of the movement for which the activity of the cell would be highest. Now, if you plot, if you plot this, uh, this function, this uh, cosine function in a polar form, what you have is the preferred direction here, and the length of the lines indicate the expected activity of this cell when movements are made at angle theta from away from the preferred direction. So this is the polar form of the two-dimensional tuning curve, cosine tuning curve. Uh, on the right, and if you look down at C, this is the three-dimensional form of the same function, which actually you can generate easily if you take this polar function, uh, keep constant this axis as an axis of rotation of the preferred direction, rotate it in 3D space, and then you get this volume, where you have the preferred direction here oriented differently because you are dealing with a different cell, uh, where the origin of the axis is eccentric, uh, so that if you would make a movement starting from here in this direction, the length of the line from here to the, uh, to the end of the solid would be the predicted rate of discharge. So the function holds pretty well in both dimensions, two and three dimensions, and here is an example actually of another cell. You see the broad tuning and the, the linear function that you get when you plot the, uh, the, the activation of the cell uh, against the cosine of this angle actually. This is what this, this particular figure is. Uh, now, I'll, the, uh, the next slide uh, shows you actually that another, I think, very important finding from these studies and that is what is the distribution of these preferred directions uh, in a large ensemble of motor cortical cells. Because you can say, fine, you have a broad tuning. It is also possible, though, that these preferred directions will be very clustered in certain domains, and that uh, that will be very important to know. Uh, what you see on the left is another example of a three-dimensional tuning curve, a little more elegant. Again, the, the, the tuning volume and the preferred direction. And on the right are the preferred directions, unit vectors of about 575 cells that are, uh, uh, were recorded in the three-dimensional case. And you see that they're distributed all around the, the directional continuum. There isn't any, uh, um, any particular clustering, a finding that has been confirmed by, by other investigators. Well, I think because I had misplaced that slide, I apologize to the projectionist. I think if we can turn the slides on now, and just in one moment, I'll show you uh, a, uh, a short video. I was inspired by the video that Dr. Hubert showed you, so it's a very similar one. You will hear uh, the, the cell activity uh, that is uh, recorded in the same way that Dr. Hubert described. Uh, However, you are also going to see the monkey making movements, so you'll try to associate the, what you hear with what you see, and as it is a video that you can look at from the top on the working surface, you'll see the lights that are coming on and off, and you will catch, I think, if you pay attention, because we're talking very short times, but you'll catch the activation of this particular cell quite early uh, with, uh, with the monkey's movements. Also, on the top left of that video, you see the electrical signals that we record. That's where the sound comes from. Uh, and uh, this particular uh, case, the, for the experts, the negativity is up. So it's, it's, a negative, uh, it's a negative spike. So when we are ready, I think we can start the beta video. Apologize for the little mix-up with the. I, I had two blanks there to get to the. We don't see anything. That's the problem. Well, I'm sorry. Something is supposed to be shown <laughs> as well. If you can rewind it and uh, and show it as well. Uh, well, I, I hate to ask you if you have questions, <laughs> but uh, if you do have, I'll entertain. Somehow, you know, we depend to finish that video before I can proceed, otherwise we're running ahead of our, of our time.
Well, uh, well, uh, let me lead you in somehow to the next question here, because you see these cells are, are broadly tuned, and that means that if you as a lay person uh, have that information, uh, still you cannot tell me what movement the monkey is making. That is, on the basis of the broad tuning curve, uh, because of the symmetric part of it, you cannot, you cannot really uh, tell me, except for the very peak uh, of the activity, uh, what, what uh, is, is the movement that is being made. Uh, and, and, that, and that does pose a, a conceptual somehow uh, problem, and that is of, of how we can infer uniquely the information about the direction of the movement if we, uh, if we just have these very broadly uh, tuning, tuning curves. So the, the idea that we, that we developed to solve, to solve that problem was, was a relatively simple one, uh, and that was that uh, it, it seemed that the whole information is still contained within the neuronal ensemble. That is, it is not, uh, don't have to use one cell. If you use more than one cell or a number of cells, you can uh, find perhaps a way that you can define uniquely uh, the information from the neural data so you can predict successfully the direction of the upcoming movement. So this is, this is the video, you see the monkey's hand moving. So this is the spike. the two-dimensional uh, task. So this is the handle. If you can put the sound louder, if that's possible, I don't know. particular cell has an ongoing uh, activity. There are others that uh, about 30% of the cells wouldn't have any, any tonic activity. This just shows you in the same format that you saw a moment ago. The, actually, we can, we can stop here. Thank you. So we're left now in our summary. I will... Uh, I'll, uh, well, you see, I went ahead of my, of my uh, somehow talk because of that. So uh, before, before I go to the ensemble coding, uh, I want to mention just two, two properties of the cells in the ensemble, you know, the motor cortex, that relate to their directionality. Uh, one is that they tend to be clustered in, in columns, much like the cells in the visual cortex. They are uh, segregated in columns according to their orientation tuning. Uh, what you see here is an example of a penetration in the cortex that we reconstructed, making small lesions. And when we recorded the activity of different cells along the penetration in the exposed part of the cortex, the preferred directions were very similar. Uh, instead, if one would make a penetration uh, down the bank, the anterior bank of the central sulcus, where the, the columns change quite abruptly, we'll see unblocked changes of the, uh, of the preferred directions of the cells. The other uh, finding that I want to mention on the right is that it's not only cells seem to be arranged in columns, but there seems to be a certain relationship between cells and, and their preferred directions and how potentially they are interconnected. So what you see here is that uh, what this graph shows is that cells that, that have very similar preferred directions, this is the angle between preferred directions, so if that tends to be zero or in a small uh, uh, interval here, then the, they tend to be synaptically uh, connected, interacting in an excitatory function, uh, whereas if, they are, are, if their preferred directions are, are opposite, uh, they, tend, they tend to be uh, inhibited. 
and that is, and that is a continuum. And this is, uh, again, a qualitatively similar finding that has been uh, observation that has been uh, also seen uh, in the visual cortex. That is, that cells with similar uh, orientation tuning, their preferred direction here, they tend to be uh, interconnected. Now, uh, this, the, the directional tuning then, and this, uh, uh, and this finding led us to uh, just develop for the, uh, for this conference somehow an aesthetic part of it, although we're using it as a, in a rigorous uh, way as a neural network modeling tool. But what you see here, how we visualize the, this network of cortical cells, they are directionally tuned, so the, the, uh, the cones point in the preferred direction of the cell in three dimensions, and the, the lines indicate the connection strengths, and if they are red, they are strong and excitatory because the cells have similar preferred directions, and you go through intermediate cases when they're light blue, they're opposite, they're inhibitory, and uh, in the yellow, if they are orthogonal, they are up, there are simply no interactions there. I will not be dealing with these modeling studies that we have been doing, but this is the, uh, this is the essential model that we use for these studies. Uh, it's, an, it's a massively interconnected, directionally tuned network uh, of, uh, of uh, simulated motor cortical neurons. Well, let me get on to the, uh, to the coding problem, which will get us close to what I think would be a, a small key for a small problem, uh, and that is to understand how an ensemble of cells in the motor cortex could provide the unique information about the direction of the movement. The left slide, the, excuse me, the, the left slide simply summarizes what we talked about. The preferred direction of the cells, the broad tuning that the preferred directions differ, from this, it follows that the cell participates in the generation of movements in many directions. And from this, it follows that many cells will be active for a movement in a particular direction. So you engage the whole ensemble. The question is, how can you get the unique information about the direction of the movement? Well, the idea we had for that is, is simply, it's, it's very simple. It is now almost trivial. In uh, 1983, we first proposed it. It, 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 was, uh, it was not trivial at all. But in any case, it, 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 it's very simple. Because the cells are directionally tuned, uh, we, say, we said, why don't we regard the uh, command, say, for, uh, for the direction of the movement as an, as an aggregate, as an ensemble of, of vectors uh, in which every line indicates the preferred direction of a cell, where the cell makes a contribution in its preferred direction. The length of the line indicates how much active the cell is. And then the vector sum, the sim simple uh, vector sum of these, of these weighted vectors, we call the population vector. We can call it the cortical pointer or something. That indeed seems to point in the direction of the movement. So if you have a movement in the up direction here, and you look at an ensemble of a couple of hundred cells, with this technique, we get a unique signal, a unique outcome. There is no ambiguity in the signal that is telling you, you can predict what the movement direction is. Uh, the animal does make, of course, movements that are always straight lines, so you have a variation in the trajectories, and of course this, there is trial to trial variability in these, in these data, so one properly should compare the movement trajectories, a family of trajectories, with some confidence interval in the population vector, and they are quite overlapping. You can see here extended, the same, the same idea. This is the same ensemble of cells. Now we're looking at the movement in another direction. So this ensemble uh, changes, not direction, but changes the length of the lines are changing because the cells are now differently active. Uh, and the vector sum points in the appropriate direction. And you see the same ensemble coding for movements in eight different directions. Now the big difference here from when we started is that we started with completely temporal spike trains. The original data that you saw were simply points in time, action potentials over time. Here we ended up with a, with a measure that is special and which is actually isomorphic to the movement space and we obtained that through the interpretation of the tuning and the population uh, uh, processing idea. Fortunately, this idea worked very nicely for the three dimensions, uh, where on the left, uh, you see the same ensemble coding for movements in different directions here. 
the red, the red line is the population vector and the yellow line is the direction of the movement. So it's the same ensemble that again takes care of, of movements in different directions. And again, more properly, one should construct a confidence interval in the population vector around here. And the yellow, which is the direction of the movement, is, is contained within, within, that, within that confidence cone. Now, we, we move to the next step, which actually is the most, the most interesting and in the sort of last part of my talk. Uh, and that is that can we use that signal now to look in temporal events? Uh, can we, as, as, as you saw before and most of you know, from the time you see a stimulus to the time you start the movement, you have the reaction time, which is a dead period of movement planning. It's fine to say you have a measure that gives you unique information, but is it useful for looking at the events in the brain as they evolve in time? That's the main question. What we did to answer that uh, was to construct, calculate the population vector every 20 milliseconds here in the reaction time, during the reaction time. So here the movement is up, T is the onset of the target, and shortly after the onset of the target, and about 180 milliseconds before the onset of the movement, you see that the population vector increases in length, changes in length, preceding the onset of the movement, and pointing in the appropriate direction of the instantaneous velocities that are coming afterwards. Similarly, if you have movement in another direction, the population vector would point in the appropriate direction as well. That to me was the most uh, somehow encouraging finding uh, from our work because it opened all kinds of possibilities. It opened the possibility that you can ask the animal to do complex tasks required to say withhold information, memorize information, process information in different ways. And that measure, I hoped, could enable us to get an insight into what is going on in the motor cortex while the animal is solving a problem. And that is what the rest of my talk will be, will be dealing with. So our uh, goal was to get some, some insights from neurophysiology into psychological processes. And what we do in general for this in my laboratory uh, is, is we start with a problem then routinely we study rigorously human subjects, human behavior in, in cognitive psychological tasks. On the basis of these results, we construct hypotheses concerning the nature of the psychological process that underlies human performance. Then we train uh, the monkeys to do as closely the, sa the same tasks as possible. During performance, we record the activity of these cells. We'll trying then to relate the neural results to the hypotheses that we have built up about the psychological process, see whether we have a match or mismatch there, and then we move to another problem. Now, the process is time consuming. Uh, it may take time to define a problem and to do the human work, but certainly it takes uh, you know, easily a year and a half to train one animal to do these tasks. So uh, that's why the publications that uh, my introducer mentioned are, uh, are quite, quite low, actually, relative to uh, quite a few other colleagues. It takes time. Now, that is our strategy that we, that we follow then, go on the neural aspects. We select a process. Uh, this variable, uh, it's more of a logic. In our case, it's the direction of movement that we operate upon. All of what I showed you before related to the understanding, the neural coding of the direction of the movement, so that we can use that knowledge to look what this variable is doing while the process is going on. I mean, the process of manipulating that variable in your mind. Therefore, I, I uh, somehow conjecture here that the, the neuron population vector We'll try to use it as a probe to decipher brain events underlying a cognitive process, and this is one of the, of the modest keys you know, for, a, for a very particular problem that I think can serve us uh, well. So the first, if you can focus the, the right slide, please. So the first thing we did that is illustrated, the results are illustrated on the, on the left slide, is we trained the animals not to move. So you show the light, and the animal is trained to withhold the movement until a go signal comes later. During that period, that is an instructed delay period, 
Uh, there is activity in the motor cortex. We knew that from other studies. But what we were interested in finding is whether the, our interpretation, the neuron population vector idea, would produce uh, an, an, an outcome that would tell us what is being the stimulus that is attended to or is being instructed. So uh, you see here three cases where the stimulus was pointing this direction or these different directions. And indeed, the population vector tends to follow the stimulus in the different directions. Now, we went one step further on the slide on, uh, shown on the, on the right here. And I, still, that is not very well focused. But what we did here, we showed, we showed the light for 300 milliseconds. Then the light was turned off. And then after a period, in this, in this case, after 750 milliseconds total, the animal had to move in the direction of the light that disappeared. So during this period, the animal had to keep in memory to remember where to go when the go signal came. This is what we call the memorized delay period. Now during this period, you see that the population vector first begins to grow and point in the direction of the potential target while the target is still on. But after the target is going off at 300 milliseconds, the population vector continues to grow and in fact still points in the proper direction. At this point, the goal signal comes, and after a reaction time, the vector increases further in length, and the movement is emitted out here. So this measure uh, somehow was, became then quite useful in identifying the information that is being kept uh, somehow in the motor cortex in a dynamic fashion, uh, both during an instructed delay period and during a memorized delay period. And I say dynamic fashion because these are time beans, this is every 10 milliseconds or so, and, and this every 20 milliseconds, so we have a continuum that we can read out that kind of information. Well, the next task that actually we did very recently uh, was, was entirely different, and, and what we wanted here, the animal, is to do a memory scanning task, that is to search in memory and identify uh, a certain element from a list of elements and make the appropriate response. So in this, in this case, uh, the animal is shown uh, targets in different uh, places on the circle that indicate potentially different directions of movement. And then one of these changes color. So in this case, is number three. The animal is trained to move to the next one in the original sequence. So it is a context recall task. It was uh, actually first described by, by Saul Sternberg in the mid-60s and it requires identification of the test stimulus. If this is the test stimulus, you have to place it within the context of the sequence and pick up the next one, in this particular case, as your response. So another name for that is scanning to locate, is an, another name for that task. Now, what one finds in this task is that the reaction time, the time that it takes you to initiate a movement, is a linear function of the number of elements that you have to deal with in your scanning. And Sterberg in 69 made a semi-elaborate scheme somehow. I won't go in detail. Simply what you see here is that when you see the test stimulus, uh, you have to, to recall the elements from the list, to scan them, compare them with the test stimulus, make a decision. What I want to point out here simply is that all of this takes time. So, so the reason we believe, or the hypothesis, I come to a hypothesis, how to explain the human results. The reason that you have this increase in the reaction time is that you, it takes time for you to go from one element to another, identify what is, what is the element, if it is the proper element, and then you choose your response. Well, we trained an animal to do this task, and I'll, I'll show you a couple of results from this particular case. Now, uh, let me start with a slide on the left here, which shows again spike activity, uh, impulse activity from a cell that we recorded under those conditions. And uh, in, this, in this case, the numbers, I'm sorry, they are indicate directions. Zero is to the, to the right, and 90 is up, and everything goes counterclockwise every 45 degrees. Uh, the stimulus was shown, the target was shown for 400 milliseconds. So it's an instructed delay task, say, in this case. You have zero time here. Uh, this period is 400 milliseconds. 
And then at this point, the go signal is given and the animal is moving in the appropriate direction, which in this case is directly in the direction uh, of, the, of the one and only target. There's just one target here. So this cell is directionally tuned as before, but we are utilizing now the differential activity of the cell for, for a couple of different cases to illustrate the fact that after the go signal in the scanning case, you first spend certain amount of time, that's about 150 or so milliseconds, for the direction of the second stimulus. What this, is, what this means here is that first the stimulus in this direction was shown, 315, then at 45 degrees, then this one, and then this was the third one. The animal was supposed to go to, to this one. So what it does, first looks, if you want, at the target at 45 degrees, the first part of the activity here is a, is a uh, practically a non-existence of activity. It, it is similar to this. And then, after a short period of time of the order of 100, 150 milliseconds, you see the activity increasing. And this is what you expect when you have this response here, which is this pattern related to the, to the upcoming movement. In contrast, if you look up here, here, the second target is 270, is this one. So the initial part, the go signal is given here. The initial part, when this, this burst comes, the initial part relates to looking at this direction, and then very abruptly, it's completely inhibited, switches off to 90, which is this one, which is complete lack of, 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 of response. Now, if you look at this case, in the population vector, you can see that much more dramatically. So here, uh, at, at this point, in this arrow, the go signal was given. The second target was 270, and the response was supposed to be upward. The point is that for a period of time, short period of time, you have the ongoing activity downward, and then very abrupt shift pointing upward. So you have almost a digital, extremely fast shift in how you scan, if you want, from, from one, from one uh, uh, direction to the other. And, and, uh, and this is one mode that we think is similar, or at least is congruent with the Sternberg's idea that you spend definite time from target to target, and that the switch from one to the other as you shift your processing is quite abrupt. Uh, the final uh, 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 task, though, that I will, I will show you uh, is a very different one. And that is, I think, the beauty of, of, of somehow this approach in the sense that, uh, depending on the task, you can get a very different result. That, that is, the technique can be quite sensitive in telling you what is the underlying process. In this case, the animal had to do two things. First of all, if the light was dim, uh, it, was supposed, it was trained to go to that target. If the target jumped to another location was bright, the animal was trained to go 90 degrees counterclockwise from that target. So here there is no scanning, or I mean, it could be, it could be scanning, for example, look up table, but, uh, but uh, by, by its nature, it's quite different task. So if you would look at individual trials here, in trial one, the target is bright and it is here, so you, you are supposed to go 90 degrees counterclockwise. In trial two, the light is bright, you are going directly to it. In this one, it's bright and you go this way and so on and so forth. So for every trial, in every case, you have to redefine, you have a fresh to define your movement on the basis of what the stimulus is and the rules of the game, which is 90 degrees counterclockwise. Now, how do you solve that problem? What, what do the humans do? Uh, so let me skip that for the case of time, the, the interest of time. How do the humans solve this problem? Again, uh, you know, you get a hunch. You get some idea of how that is solved. And the crucial finding was that the reaction time in human subjects increases as a linear function of the angle that you have to switch away from a given target. So if you have to move away 20 degrees or 40 degrees and so on, your reaction time will be higher and higher. Now, there are not many ways you can explain that. Our hypothesis was that given a task that you have to move at an angle from a direction, then your, in your reaction time, what you do, you shift your motor intention 
from initially being in the target direction to being in the movement direction. And the time that takes to in that increases here is taken because it takes time to rotate these images in your mind. So in contrast to the memory scanning digital sort of process, here, in hypothesis anyway, we're dealing with an analog process. That is, you, we hypothesize a continuous somehow uh, shift in this internal image, which if you, as you, as you can understand, we, we identify with the population vector. So the question is, if you, do, uh, if you record from an animal and look at the population vector, will it jump around or will it move in a continuous fashion? And, and what we found was just a second. So what you see here, uh, is the case where the light was bright to the right and the animal had to move 90 degrees counterclockwise to the left. And as you move up uh, in time this way, we pick it up 90 milliseconds after the onset of the target where the population vector begins to lengthen and provide a signal. So as you move up, you see that the vector first, first points in the direction of the stimulus and gradually rotates counterclockwise to point in the direction of the movement. You see it here also, where the movement is in the same direction. In the direct case, in the direct task, you have a, a, the population vector points in the direction of the movement. But in the rotation task, it points first upward and then gradually switches counterclockwise, which you see it here more clearly, to stabilize in along the direction of the movement. Now, the value of this is not just it, it gives some unique, again, information about you know, how this processing is done, but also in comparison to the memory scanning result, where you had a very abrupt shift, almost 180 degrees of the population vector, uh, it points to the fact that you can identify fundamentally different processes that uh, the animal would use to solve a particular problem. The other thing that is very interesting is that this slope here of the change in the population vector direction versus time is very similar to what you find in human subjects when you look at the slope of their function, which boils down to about 400 degrees per second. So this somehow completes the loop that I, I showed you for this particular case. We started with the problem of transformation in direction space. The human behavior showed us a linear increase of the reaction time versus the angle. From this, we inferred that we have a mental rotation of an internal image. We train the animal to do the same task. We identified the population vector rotating. So there was a good congruence between the two. And then we move up to another problem. OK, now there's a three minute video to at least end in a positive note. Sorry for the previous trouble we had with the other video. If you can, if you can show that, please. This is, uh, this is not neural data. They are simulated data of what, I mean, the, the database is, is experimental, but you, you get an idea of what the dynamic somehow uh, function is uh, for, this, for this kind of analysis. So this would be a straight movement task where you have the light and you have the population vector, the cells increasing, and the vector is the red one that uh, points in the direction of the movement, and then the movement uh, is, uh, is elicited. What uh, the, the two things that you will see here, one is the, the memory task, not the memory scanning, but the memorized delay task and the, and the mental rotation task. So this is the movement at an angle from a visual stimulus, which is the mental rotation task. So when the color is, is, is orange, I don't know if this looks like an orange, it's a, uh, this is a direct task. Remember that in the task they were intermixed. So from trial to trial, the animal did not know which, which, tri which uh, position that will be. Whereas when the light here is green, uh, it it indicates the uh, somehow movement directly. So this is a rotation case.
Now, what we have been doing with the neural network, just to entertain you, we're not going to see it here, is to exactly take it, take as an output from that network, you know, the population vector of the network, and describe trajectories, arbitrary trajectories, that is writing its name or, uh, or making ellipses or, uh, or, other, or other aspects, and, and look at the, uh, at the underlying constraints in such a network that are generated when it is forced, it is trained, to generate a dynamic uh, trajectory out of stringing together a small uh, uh, continuous direct, uh, population vectors. So here's the memorized task. You see how it is. You first, the, the target appears. It stays there for a very short time. Then it disappears. And that's the memorized delay period. So as the light appears, there is a small increase in the population. Then during the memorized delay, you have retaining. The network retains that, that increment and then it is, there, is, there is further increase. Actually, during the memorized delay period, there is a little further increase uh, in, this, in this vector. Okay, and that is something that we did not do, but uh, Andy Schwartz in uh, Arizona has done and published now, actually, in a recent paper in Science not too long ago, where we visualized, proposed that the continuous performance of a continuous trajectory would be done by the population vectors being st strung tip to tail and changing continuously in time. And uh, that is, uh, you can stop the video, please. And the last, uh, the last two slides is uh, pure aesthetic somehow. Uh, on the left, it's one way we visualized the rotation of the population vector from the uh, stimulus direction to the movement direction. And when my friend uh, Richard Passingham, professor of psychology in the University of Oxford, uh, saw that paper, uh, he sent me a letter with a slide. That's probably the first time I had received a slide of that sort, uh, which is shown on the right, actually. And the, letter, and the letter was saying that he thanks me for the reprints and all of that, and that I am sending a slide of a picture which is up on the wall in this department, and that is the Department of Psychology in the University of Oxford in England. Uh, the label says that it is by Alan Gross in Washington Street Gallery, Cape May. With your paper in mind, I thought this picture should be renamed Population Vectors Making Up Their Mind. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your patience.
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll break for coffee out on the mall, and uh, there will be some responses to Apostolus uh, at, uh, the, in the next hour. But we're 10 to 3, and we need to be back here at 3.30, and you need a break. So go for it. <laughs>